Um, thank you to the Student Legal Forum. This is a, a kind of an interesting annual event where we take a look at the most recent term of the Supreme Court. I always hope for just dreadful weather, and we're competing against one of the most stunning afternoons of the year, so we better be good, uh, Mimi and Carrie. We want to really grab them by the scruff of the neck. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the term, it, the term itself in general, and also the emerging Roberts Court, and then uh, Professors uh, Abrams and Riley will give us two vignettes of the two cases that I think are the most important cases of the term. They are the health care case and the Arizona immigration case. Uh, we, we obviously are not trying to be comprehensive. We simply want to hit some highlights. So we're not planning to have a Q&A period. We thought when we're done, there'll be refreshments, I understand, provided by the forum. So hang around, and I'm sure that uh, my colleagues and I'd be happy to take questions and have some conversation with you. Now, with that, that in mind, uh, and uh, my colleagues have been kind enough to give me a little more time than they respectively will take because I have to give not only an overview but talk about areas uh, which they won't take up. A word or two about the docket in the 2011-2012 term. There were only 75 merits cases decided, not all of which had uh, full opinions. That's very low. There's been a declining number of cases in recent years. If you go back to the Warren Court in the 1960s, they decided about 150 cases a year. No one is quite sure why this is going on, but you might consider it the great shrinking docket, if you like. Of course, that means they have more time to write more pages for the opinions they do hand down, which means that when you're in class, you wonder why there are all these concurring and dissenting opinions to, to dissect, and that may be one of the reasons. They were unanimous in about one-third of the cases, some of them not terribly important cases, and they handed down five to four decisions in roughly 20% of the cases, 15 out of the uh, 75. It was a term that's worth talking about because though the um, Roberts Court is now has finished seven years and we can begin to paint a portrait of it, uh, this term in some ways was aberrational. At least it invites us to question the conventional wisdom about the, uh, about the Roberts Court. And I want to get to some of the lineups and some of the personalities in, in a moment. But several generalizations about the Roberts Court, and these are generalizations which, as I say, might now be open to question, at least in part as a result of the most recent term. The first is, I think, the old day of surprises on the court are over, namely that uh, it used to be you had David Souter, or John Paul Stevens, Harry Blackman, people who started out in one place on the court and gravitated well across the spectrum. I think it's fair to say, since those justices have left the court, that by and large, the justices proved to vote more or less according to the expectations of the presidents that put them there. So there's more, certainly leaving aside Kennedy for the moment, most of the justices are by and large what you would have expected them to be. Again, this most recent term uh, subjects that particular generalization to question. Secondly, I think you can certainly say the Roberts Court and the Rehnquist Court before it are distinctly more conservative tribunals than the Warren and Berger Courts were back in the 60s and 70s. And one of the reasons for that is Alito replacing O'Connor. 2005, when Roberts and Alito came to the court, uh, O'Connor had been sort of a centrist, a moderating influence. She was replaced by Alito, who's now predictably one of the most uh, conservative justices on the court. Again, the most recent term sort of disturbs that generalization because there were several liberal victories, depending on how you define liberal. I think the health care case would have been one that was somewhat surprising, namely the Obama administration won that one. Uh, the Arizona immigration case came down forcefully on the side of uh, federal uh, primacy. Uh, there were uh, criminal justice cases like the one striking down mandatory life sentences for juvenile murderers without possibility of parole. Cases like that certainly invite you to remember that any general trend to the right in the Roberts Court is open to exceptions and uh, individual cases. Thirdly, I think it's fair to say that judicial activism is not dead. If you're tempted to think that activism means liberal, and that means the Warren Court and that sort of thing, uh, I think we have to say this court understands activism just as well as the Warren Court did. I think, for example, of Citizens United, 
the campaign finance case several years ago uh, in which the court really reached out for the constitutional question and uh, it was certainly not a judicially minimalist case. But again, even that generalization I think is open to some question when you think, for example, about the um, Roberts decision which we'll be hearing about today in the health care case. Well, you, we can paint a general picture of the, uh, of the Roberts court. I think it might be interesting to take a few minutes and make several comments about some of the individual justices on the court to sort of personalize what's going on. And the most obvious candidate is John Roberts himself. Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, who came to the court seemingly as a judicial minimalist, has turned out to be a rather, a rather intriguing figure on the court. Think, for example, about his vote in the health care case. Uh, one might have thought that he would wind up with a conservative majority striking down the law. We will discover that he didn't do that. Uh, and he, when he agreed with the conservatives on the Commerce Clause point, but not on the taxing power, he upheld the act, the individual mandate, as um, reposing on the taxing power. Uh, people were sort of puzzled. And there was a, one of the theories about Robert's vote in that case is that he was acting as a statesman. Namely, he was thinking institutionally and worried that if the court were to strike down the health care law, the court might be indicted as being partisan, rather as people said it was in Bush versus Gore back in 2000. So a, a sort of an, a benign view of Robert's vote is that he was playing, uh, what, John Marshall in Marbury versus Madison in the health care case. Uh, he certainly has not departed the conservative ranks very often. They're really only, before the health care case, only twice in seven years had um, Roberts departed the conservative side to join the liberals in a five to four decision. So that's pretty consistently conservative on, on his part. Conservatives were very unhappy with, with uh, Roberts because this vote, they thought he was an apostate, he had jumped ship, you know, who is this guy that we believed in him and he's deserted us. Um, there was apparently some unease within the court. Uh, there were leaks of the notion that maybe he had originally planned to go with the conservatives and then changed his mind, and that some conservative justices were, were really quite, quite angry with him. Um, I think that sort of thing is overblown. I think if, if there was some unhappiness, it will pass. And I certainly am not prepared to predict that we have discovered that uh, John Roberts is a liberal after all. <laughs> I just don't, do not leave this room assuming, assuming that. So uh, John Roberts, I think, Interesting, this term, it's very much Robert's court. The other most interesting person is Anthony Kennedy. Uh, Justice Kennedy is the one who's now in the catbird seat, where Lewis Powell used to be in the Burger court, where Sandra Day O'Connor was in the Rehnquist court. We now find Kennedy, journalists like to call him the swing vote. I think that's not a very useful term. He really is the fifth and critical vote, and frequently the one that decides where the court will go. In the most recent term, he voted with the majority 93% of the time, more than any other member of the court, and that has been the trend throughout the Roberts Court period. You may have seen uh, Time Magazine this summer did a cover with uh, Kennedy on the cover, and they called him the decider, as I, as, as I recall. So where he is, the court typically is, and certainly in some of the high-profile cases this term, he was the critical vote in the, two, in, in the Arizona immigration case, not in the health care case, but certainly in some of the others. So if you're a petitioner in the Supreme Court, you're writing briefs to, to the court, you don't want to quite say in bold letters, G Kennedy, this is for you, <laughs> but you're going to have him in mind when you frame your argument. Now what about the conservatives on the court? The most interesting one, taught here briefly, Anthony, a Antonin Scalia. I mean, who, lay people all know who Scalia is, probably more than any other member on the court. His scathing opinions, they burn the wallpaper off a room. Uh, you love to read them in con law because they, they're really interesting. You, you, you can't ignore them. Uh, he, he dissented a lot this time. He and Breyer were actually the most frequent dissenters in the 2011-2012 term. And he's re he always writes interesting opinions, I'm sure, uh, Mimi will talk about his dissent in the Arizona immigration case where he came out for state sovereignty. Uh, he dissented very strongly in cases involving uh, giving uh, 
defendants uh, the right to counsel in plea bargaining cases. He read his dissent from the uh, bench uh, very scathingly in, in that case. So he's known for his wit, for his, his sharp questions. He's the one who asks the most questions in oral argument. So be on the lookout if you're in the Supreme Court. When you look in his direction, he's going to jump you with a, with a question. Uh, people think he's getting increasingly shrill, maybe even kind of wacky. He doesn't care. <laughs> it doesn't fall. Of course, why should he care? He's on the Supreme Court for life or good behavior. So, you know, it, criticism is water off his back. He, he was quoted as saying, I don't know that I'm cantankerous. I simply express myself vividly. Okay, Nino, if that's what you think. Uh, Justice Thomas, what to say about a man who five years and counting has not asked a single question in oral argument? <laughs> he sits mute through He's a very gregarious guy. If you met him personally, he's, he's really quite interesting, but uh, he doesn't want to talk in court. There was some question whether he should have recused himself in the health care case because his wife is politically active in conservative causes. Uh, I think he quite properly chose not to recuse. I didn't think he needed to do that. Um, Justice Alito on the conservative side, increasingly one of the most interesting people on the court. When he came on the court, they called him Scalito, as if he would simply be in Justice Scalia's hip pocket. He's not. Uh, he really is beginning to emerge in a very distinctive way. For example, in the, there was a Fourth Amendment uh, GPS case about attaching uh, tracking devices to defendants' cars. And uh, in that case, when he, he wrote a concurring opinion that would lead me to think he might be the justice on the court most sensitive to privacy concerns. He's also written some very interesting solo dissents in First Amendment cases where the court eight to one, the uh, funeral protest case a year ago, remember that case where really nasty things were being said at military funerals, and he was the one who sort of was most likely to bring into balance privacy and, and human dignity. On the liberal side of the court, what I find interesting here are the two newest justices, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan, the two uh, Obama appointees, uh, the liberal wing of the court won some important cases this term, and for the most part, they were the deciding votes that made that possible. They agree with each other uh, at a very high rate, and they're especially interesting in oral argument. The pace of oral argument in the last dec few decades has increasingly picked up. It's been very, very lively, and uh, Sotomayor is second only to Scalia in the number of questions she asks, and she is first among the nine justices in asking the first question. She is the one most likely to be first off the mark and jump counsel when the, when the argument starts. So I'm watching them with a great deal of interest. I think they both have powerful minds. They seem to have earned the respect of their colleagues, and it may be that in time that Sotomayor and Kagan will become the William Brennan and Thurgood Marshall of the Roberts Court. And the court has lacked that sort of strong leadership on the left side of the court. So watch those two justices in particular. Now, before I turn it over to my two colleagues, a quick comment on each of three substantive areas that they will not be talking about, just to give you a little bit of picture of the rest of the term. Uh, first, a comment on criminal justice. Uh, who is better off this time, the government, the prosecutors, or defendants? Uh, you could fairly debate that. Criminal defendants did relatively rather well this term in cases, for example, the GPS tracking case uh, was ruled in, their, in defendants' favor. Um, the right to counsel in plea bargaining. I mean, what, 97% of criminal cases are probably decided by plea bargains now, and the Sixth Amendment right to counsel has now been extended to that part of the criminal process. So this is not the war in court. I mean, they're not being that liberal, but defendants have done, in some cases, relatively well. The cases reflect a great deal of turbulence within the court on how to view criminal, criminal matters. Uh, that tracking case, for example, uh, reveals a ideological kind of split in the court in which, on the one hand, you had five justices joining Scalia re-emerging in effect, reintroducing a kind of a common law notion that Fourth Amendment search and seizure turns on physical trespass, the old common law notion. 
On the other hand, five different justices seem to be leaning towards saying that it's expectation of privacy that matters. And obviously in a digital age, that will become a major point of contention. Here Sotomayor wrote perhaps the most interesting opinion in that particular case. I think we can almost sum up criminal justice cases by saying uh, it depends on what Kennedy thinks. Justice Kennedy, who's you know fundamentally a conservative, uh, sometimes consults, what shall we call it, his inner compass. <laughs> he looks into how does he feel about the case. And if his sense of fair play is violated, he's likely to vote with the defendant. And so the court, for example, has been increasingly cutting back on the power of states to deal with juvenile defendants. Uh, for example, the mandatory uh, life sentence without possibility of parole case that have been at least three cases in recent years dealing with uh, juveniles under the Eighth Amendment. And in those cases, uh, Kennedy has been with the he's either written or joined uh, the, 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 uh, the majority. So basically, I, I guess I could sum up criminal justice by saying in this part of the court's docket, it really is Kennedy's court and not simply the Roberts court. Second area, the First Amendment. I have never been able to make sense of the First Amendment cases. I mean, the, it's impossible to come up with a, a unified general uh, philosophy of what the court thinks it's doing in First Amendment cases. There are, I think, fundamentally two ways that First Amendment scholars look at the Roberts Court. One is that it's a robust, sturdy, vigorous defender of the First Amendment more than any court that preceded it. I think uh, Ken Starr, for example, has taken that position. And there are cases that would justify that point of view. Uh, this term, for example, um, United States versus Alvarez, the Stolen Valor case, where the court held that uh, the act that says you can't lie about your military decorations violates the First Amendment. And that's one of those cases that just breathes the air of First Amendment freedom. Uh, on the other hand, there are there are uh, commentators who think that the court is being selective, that it, it's, it sounds like a First Amendment course, but it really defends the First Amendment when it chooses, and that it depends on the ideological interests that are at stake, and hence the um, campaign finance cases, where they've struck down public financing of elections, which would produce more speech, but the court has struck it down. I think what's going on is that the traditional view of the First Amendment is really an anti-discrimination principle, a political equality principle, you know, this sort of marketplace to which everybody should have free, free access. I think the Roberts Court is trending towards a different view of the First Amendment, namely seeing First Amendment in political liberty terms, namely simply skepticism of anything the government does that touches the area of free speech. So if those are different philosophies, I think the Roberts Court is trending from one to the other. Uh, finally, the other area I wanted to mention is business. Now, I'm not a, I don't teach business law, so it's not my turf. But you're bound to ask the question, is the Roberts Court pro-business? The Warren Court back in the 60s and 70s was, tended to be for the little man. Antitrust laws were vigorously enforced and the like. So, is the Roberts Court pro-business? Well, in the most recent term, depending on how you count the cases, there were something like 25 cases in which business interests were clearly at play, and the business interests seemed to have prevailed in something like 19 out of the 25 cases. That's pretty lopsided. It's interesting that in every case in which the U.S. Chamber of Commerce filed a brief, on the issues which they took up in their briefs, which the court actually considered in the court's opinion, the court sided with the Chamber of Commerce in every case. It's 100%. Even in cases where the Solicitor General had weighed in on the other side, and given the, the Solicitor General usually has a big win rate in the U.S. Supreme Court, so that's sort of anomalous. Now, maybe this one term isn't representative, but it certainly would add, invite you to think about a trend towards business interest in the Supreme Court. That's true. also, also true of preemption cases. The court had preemption cases this term where they struck down state laws, which business uh, didn't like. So there you have a few snapshots in the most recent term. Uh, one comment before I turn it over about the term to come. You know, first Monday in October, the court will be sitting. Uh, obviously, they will be adding cases as they go along. The two areas that right now I can say are likely to be really interesting. First, affirmative action. 
All of you know about the Grutter case, the Michigan case, in which the court has allowed universities to use race as a factor among other factors in the admissions process. Uh, O'Connor is off the court now and was a key figure in that case. We now have the University of Texas plan coming before the court, which court will hear oral, oral arguments this fall, and we will see whether Grutter will survive the uh, Roberts Court analysis. Uh, the other area which is on its way there, it's, I don't think they've granted cert yet, but uh, gay marriage. There are cases bubbling up in two parts of the country. The uh, Ninth Circuit had the Proposition 8 case from California, and that could be considered fairly narrow in that the federal court out there struck down the law on the grounds that it actually had betrayed a certain animus towards uh, homosexuals and lesbians, and therefore could be really thought of as an equal protection case. Uh, but the other case that's coming up is really the one that I think is maybe most likely to land on the, in the court's lap, and that is the um, Defense of Marriage Act case coming out of the uh, Second Circuit. And uh, will the court decide that gay marriage is a constitutionally protected right? That may be a stretch, notwithstanding Lawrence versus Texas, the sodomy case out of Texas a few years ago. But that's certainly bound to be a very high-profile case. Well, there you have my view of the current term and there's a thought or two about what's coming down the pike. And so let me now uh, conclude that and turn it over to uh, Carrie Abrams and Mimi Riley. Thank you very much. Thanks again to the Student Legal Forum for having us here and to Professor Howard. I'm going to focus my re remarks on the Arizona versus the United States case. Uh, as many of you probably know, the statute that was at issue in the Arizona case uh, is commonly referred to as SB 1070, but the full name of the statute is the Support Our Law Enforcement and Safe Neighborhoods Act of 2010. So what this statute attempted to do was to regulate immigration without actually regulating immigration. It's very well settled law that states cannot regulate the core functions of immigration, the entry and admission of aliens into the country and their removal. Uh, but states do have some room to regulate how immigrants are treated once they are in a state. And that's where uh, the difficult cases come up. So what Arizona did was it, it enacted several uh, pieces of this statute uh, that criminalized certain actions. For example, they made it a crime for an immigrant to fail to register with the federal government. Now it's already a crime if you fail to register with the federal government, but this added a state crime on top of the federal crime. Uh, they made it a crime for an unauthorized immigrant to seek employment or hold employment. That is not currently a federal crime, but they made it one at the state level. They also authorized police to arrest people who the police suspected of having committed a crime that would make them deportable. There are certain crimes that make uh, a non-citizen deportable, and police might be aware of facts that, that would indicate that a person had committed one of those crimes. If they had probable cause, they could then arrest the person without a warrant. And finally, the law required police to check the papers of anyone that they arrested um, or stopped if they suspected them of being an unauthorized immigrant. And that, that last provision has gotten the most press. It's often been called the papers please or show your papers provision of the law. So after Arizona passed this statute, and it also included several other provisions, these are just the ones that were contested in this case. After they passed the statute, the federal government brought a case challenging it. And they asked for a preliminary injunction in joining some of these uh, sections of the statute. Um, their, their theory was not a racial profiling theory or an equal protection theory. Uh, there are a lot of other cases out there right now that do bring claims like that. Some police officers brought claims. The ACLU has cases that are alleging that this statute will encourage racial profiling. But the federal government's claim was much different. Uh, their claim was that this was an exclusively federal area of regulation and therefore it was preempted and that Arizona couldn't simultaneously legislate in the same area that the federal government was legislating in. So it's not a question necessarily of how non-citizens are being treated. It's a question of who gets to decide how to treat them. Is it going to be a state or is it going to be the federal government? 
Now, the procedural posture of the case is really important here. This was decided on a preliminary injunction. And so the district court enjoined the statute, or these, these four sections of the statute, before they even went into effect. That makes a difference in terms of how the Supreme Court is looking at it. They don't have an enforcement record. They don't know how law enforcement in Arizona is going to try to enforce the statute, and they don't know how courts are going to interpret it. And so that means they essentially have to say that the statute is preempted on its face, if they're going to say that. There is no interpretation of the statute that wouldn't be preempted. And that's a very high burden to meet. Nevertheless, uh, the district judge had enjoined all four of the sections of the statute at issue, and the Ninth Circuit, in a two-to-one decision, had affirmed the district court's decision. So, in an opinion written by Justice Kennedy, uh, the, the vote that matters, <laughs> um, the, the Supreme Court affirmed three out of four, the, the preliminary enjoining of three out of four of these sections, but reversed on one of them. Uh, and the opinion is a, uh, in, in the opinion, Justice Kennedy got the votes of Sotomayor, Breyer, Ginsburg, and Roberts. And so we have uh, another case where Roberts is in the, in the majority. We have three dissents from Justices Alito, Thomas, and Scalia. But Alito, Alito jumps over to the majority side on one of the sections of the statute. So let me work through uh, the sections uh, in a little bit more detail to explain what the court's logic was. The first section they considered was section three of SB 1070, which was the criminalizing the failure to register part. Uh, so under federal law, non-citizens are required to register with the federal government and carry proof of registration with them. And failure to do that is a misdemeanor, and the misdemeanor is punishable by a fine or by imprisonment or by probation. What Arizona did, what SB 1070 did, was they also made it a state misdemeanor uh, to, to do exactly the same thing that the federal law prohibited. Uh, so in doing this, they were trying to come up with a, a statute that mirrored the terms of the federal statute exactly. A mirror image theory has been a, a great favorite of drafters of state immigration legislation. The theory is we're only doing exactly what the federal government already wants done, uh, and we're using exactly the same language. We're not creating our own state alien registration system. We're just piggybacking off the federal government's. So how could the federal government have a problem with that? Well, what the court said was the federal government could have a problem with that uh, because the federal government has occupied the field of alien registration. So in applying field preemption, the court figures out whether there is a field of law that is exclusively occupied by the federal government. And if Congress has, a, has the power to enact legislation in that area, then they are entitled to occupy the field. And they can kind of draw the field as narrowly or as widely as they want. So here the field isn't all legislation affecting immigrants, it's alien registration schemes. Um, and so they've occupied the field of alien registration, therefore the state isn't allowed to do anything in that field. Uh, they also poked a few other holes in the mirror image theory by giving kind of a backup holding, saying that this also might create a conflict. The other major kind of preemption is conflict or obstacle preemption, in which even if a state is allowed to simultaneously pass legislation in an area, it can't conflict with the federal legislation so much that it creates an obstacle to the enforcement of the federal legislation. And they say, look, um, the, the majority opinion says, look, this penalty is bigger than the federal penalty. The federal pen penalty includes probation. Uh, the Arizona statute doesn't allow for probation. So you're criminalizing the same activity, but you're giving a bigger penalty. That conflicts with federal law. Um, in addition, the executive has uh, the authority to decide how to enforce the particular law. Here you'd have Arizona coming in and maybe enforcing it against people that the federal government wouldn't want to enforce it against. So you might have a conflict problem as well. The next section, section 5C, was the section that made it a crime for an illegal immigrant to search for a job or to hold a job in the state. Here, the court preempted the statute using an obstacle preemption theory. There was no question that a state is allowed to legislate in the employment area. States regulate employees within the state all the time. So we didn't have a situation where Congress has occupied the field of employment law. So instead, they looked to a conflict or obstacle preemption uh, analysis. And Justice Kennedy says, the federal law doesn't impose criminal penalties on 
the employee. The federal law imposes criminal penalties on the employer. There may be good reasons for that. You know, maybe uh, they want, maybe Congress wants DHS to be able to get employees to talk to them about the people who are employing them illegally. Uh, may, maybe there are good reasons for not criminalizing the behavior um, of, of people who might already be in a vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis their employers because of their lack of authorized presence. Uh, the federal statute did include penalties. It included penalties such as deportation or the inability to adjust status to get a green card, but it did not have these criminal penalties. So that was a fairly easy case, um, I think, for the court with conflict preemption. The tougher provisions were Section 6, the warrantless arrest section, and Section 2B, the papers please section. Section 6 allowed a state police officer to arrest someone without a warrant if he or she believed that the per or had probable cause to believe that the person had committed any public offense that makes him removable from the United States. Now the court also held that this was preempted on a conflict preemption theory. Um, but Justice Alito wrote a fairly persuasive uh, rebuttal to that in his dissent, uh, in which they're, they're both the majority and the dissent are construing the terms of the statute differently, and either one of them seems like a potentially plausible way to read the statute. The majority says, look, the statute says that you have to cooperate. Uh, the state can cooperate with the federal government in enforcing immigration law. Um, Arizona is trying to cooperate. If they suspect that someone is deportable, they're going to arrest them and then let the federal government know that they're available. They're not actually going to deport them themselves, but they're going to make that initial arrest. Um, Justice Kennedy says, no, cooperation requires an agreement with the federal government first. The federal government needs to say, I want you to cooperate with me uh, and, 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 and let you know that they're interested in having a particular person uh, arrested. And just arresting the person and then notifying the federal government isn't really cooperation. So it's really a fight over what cooperation means and, and either position might be plausible. What the court does, I think, to get to the, its conclusion in the, in the conflict preemption analysis is bring in notions of federal sovereignty into the opinion and into its analysis for this section to show that the United States is the sovereign in question and the United States gets to create its own deportation policy. And if Arizona is allowed to try to jump the line and put some people in, in the front of the line to get deported or even to be considered for deportation, that's getting in the way of federal enforcement. Finally, the last section is the one that the court uh, reversed uh, the Ninth Circuit and the District Court's opinion on. The Papers Please provision uh, required state law enforcement officers to investigate the immigration status of someone who they had already stopped, detained, or arrested if they had a reasonable suspicion that the individual was in the country illegally. So notice this isn't uh, you get to stop someone because you suspect they're here illegally provision. It's you've already stopped the person for some other reason and then you suspect that they might be here illegally. Then you're required to ask uh, or to, to investigate their, their status. It furthermore provides that any person who is arrested shall have the person's immigration status determined before the person is released. So for stops, they need to investigate. For an actual arrest, they have to determine at least that's what the language of the statute looks like. They have to determine what the person's status is before they can release them. So, Justice Kennedy's opinion gives us two hypotheticals to try to illustrate what's going on here. With regard to the first piece of that section, he says, imagine someone's jaywalking in Tucson and they're stopped for jaywalking and they don't have ID. And the police officer could ask for their ID and if they didn't have it, they could investigate who this person was. Um, this doesn't mean they can take the person into custody. Uh, this law doesn't necessarily give them the authority to then arrest that person for not having the ID. It just allows them to investigate. And if it doesn't take them longer than a few minutes to give the person a ticket for jaywalking, they're not going to be allowed, because of the statute, necessarily to detain the person any longer. It's plausible that you could read the statute that way. And if Arizona reads the statute that way, it might not be preempted by federal law. If, on the other hand, they read it to say, the person who's jaywalking doesn't have ID, now I'm taking them into custody to check, that, that would cause a constitutional problem. On the second piece, uh, the example he uses is a driving under the influence uh, case. 
He says, imagine that someone is stopped for driving under the influence and taken in, say, for a breathalyzer test. Uh, it might take about as long to give them that test, um, and it might take about as long to detain them for however you usually however long you usually detain someone for drug driving as it would take to actually establish that they, what, the, what their immigration status is. Um, and if it takes about the same amount of time and you're not detaining the person longer than the amount of time it takes to do the law enforcement function, then there's not a problem. So they reverse the preliminary injunction on Section 2B, but only by reading it in this really narrow way which I don't think, based on the, my reading of the legislative history and the politics surrounding the passage of the statute, is necessarily what the drafters were hoping for. Um, so Arizona won, in, in theory, on Section 2B, in that their statute has been upheld at the preliminary injunction stage as not facially invalid, not facially preempted. But now all eyes are going to be on Arizona to see how it actually enforces the statute. The ACLU has a hotline. The U.S. Department of Justice has a hotline <laughs> where people are supposed to call in if they think that it is being enforced in a discriminatory manner or contrary to the outlines that the Supreme Court has, has given here. And so it, it may give Arizona some of what it had hoped for in this enforcement, um, in, in assisting in immigration enforcement, but it's not nearly as much as, as what it could have been. A couple other things I wanted to mention. One is, I won't go through all of the dissents, but Justice Scalia's dissent here is just fascinating. Uh, he has, as, as Professor Howard alluded to, a theory of state sovereignty that far exceeds any of the other justices. He basically says in his dissent, look, the, the main, the most important part of state sovereignty is being able to decide who can enter and leave your borders. And Arizona has that power. And I don't think any of the other justices would say that it would be acceptable for Arizona to set up its own visa system, for example. But that seems to be the implication of the, of the uh, dissent. Um, he has a lot of historical evidence for the idea that states have power over immigration. I think he's right with a lot of the historical evidence, um, but it only goes up till about 1837 and then stops. And which, I mean, you know, so, 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 so it, it's, it's arguably, I think there are people who disagree, on, who are on both sides, but it's arguably true that states had more power over immigration than the federal government did prior to the Civil War. Uh, but after the Civil War, with the Reconstruction Amendments, there's a lot of things that become more federal, and immigration is one of them. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a nostalgic opinion wanting to go back to this other time when states had a lot more sovereignty than they have now. The other thing I thought was interesting in light of some of, the, some of Professor Howard's comments about Roberts, Justice Roberts, and also um, the conservatives versus the liberals on this case is uh, on the court is that I, I'm not sure that it's right to read this case as a victory for the liberals. Uh, given that it was the Obama administration bringing the case and um, a more conservative administration in Arizona uh, defending it, it's easy to think of this as conservative states' rights versus liberal big federal government kind of case. Um, but there are other ways of looking at it. So. There's a lot in the opinion about the importance of federal sovereignty in the majority opinion and how the federal government needs to have absolute control over these immigration functions. I think one reason that language might be there is that the executive might have its own power over some of, the, some of these immigration functions. And the case law in immigration is really divided and unclear on the extent to which the executive has independent power. So some of the folks who are writing about the unitary executive in the foreign affairs context, for example, might want a really strong executive. Uh, they might just not like the executive that they've got right now, uh, but they might want a strong executive and think that the executive has independent power over immigration. The court hasn't really wanted to address that issue. And so by talking kind of generally about foreign affairs as being implicated by Arizona's actions here, I think it's able to uh, strike down laws that threaten the Department of Homeland Security's ability to enforce the law how it, however it wants to, um, even though Congress may or may not have intended them to have that much authority. Thanks.
much shorter than Carrie. Um, so to start with the words of SCOTUS blog, this is complicated. Um, the opinion itself was 190 pages, so if I read it, uh, we'd be here a long time. Uh, I'm going to start with a little background, and that is to situate this in, in the Health Care Act itself. And what I think it's important to remember from the beginning is, as Dick said, this is a case that actually tests the court's core values. Um, it pits what your conception is of rights, positive versus negative rights. It pits what you view as the role of deliberative democracy, whether deliberative democracy can actually ensure justice or whether only markets can ensure justice. And so from the very beginning, as we started to debate health care, it was inevitable we were going to be here. Now, most health care policy experts on all sides of the debate have believed that health care is in a state of near crisis and has been for decades. So the debate's not whether we need to fix it, it's how to fix it. And the Obama administration came in absolutely determined it was going to fix it. And it considered a number of options. One was true socialized medicine, such as we have in Britain. Another was a single payer option, as in Canada. Those are actually vastly different, even though in the news they're constantly conflated. And what we got was the ACA, which is actually the most market-oriented of the potential plans. It's actually roughly similar to the Swiss model, and its roots are actually in the Nixon administration. So if you actually look through the the evolution of the court, it's, it's fascinating to see where this is coming from. So the majority of the thousand so, uh, pages of the ACA, and I'm going to actually call it either the ACA or now I embrace Obamacare, so I'm going to call it Obamacare sometimes too, involve insurance reform. There are additional sections that deal with Medicare. You're hearing a lot about those, some pilot programs. But most of this is insurance reform. And the centerpiece parts of insurance reform are the elimination of the pre-existing uh, exclusions, the creation of state insurance exchanges, which are designed to increase transparency and introduce competition, and then finally, the expansion of Medicaid a very large expansion, taking it not just to pregnant women and children, but to all individuals up to 133% of the federal poverty level. And since this plan was going to require insurance companies to take on many new people and likely sicker people, there needed to be ways to have funds for the insurance companies to uh, function to provide the health care that everyone would then be getting. And so what came to be is what we now call the individual mandate. And beginning in 2014, almost everyone is required to have health insurance or to pay a penalty to the IRS. And without it, the fear is that the only people who will participate is the people who are already sick. Because of the pre-existing exclusion, what you could do is just wait till you got sick and then without penalty come into the insurance market. Now, from the very beginning, from the moment Obamacare was signed into law, we all knew we would be standing here. We didn't, weren't sure what year, but we knew we'd be here. Uh, no one was quite sure what form that challenge would take. Um, but it quickly became clear that we were going to be dealing with a Commerce Clause challenge to the individual mandate. And at first, most law professors, me too, maybe you, Dick, um, thought that was going to fail. Um, I have lots of colleagues who are in the newspapers saying this is a dead argument. And then this is one of the very few cases where law professors actually matter. Randy Barnett, a Georgetown law professor, uh, began to promote a distinction between activity and inactivity. He argued that people who did not buy health insurance weren't participants in the market. Therefore, there was no activity in interstate commerce, and the federal government was therefore not permitted to regulate. 
all of a sudden the challenge seemed to have legs, but they were still pretty shaky legs. Um, in fact, Justice Scalia in Cruzan, not a Commerce Clause case, had a decade ago, it's actually a uh, so-called right to die case, had completely excoriated an argument on the activity inactivity difference and said it was absurd. So ultimately, it was the 11th Circuit's decision striking down the mandate in what is its official name, National Federation of Independent Business v. Sibelius. I'm going to call it Sibelius, and I fear it's Sibelius I. We'll see it again, that name, that's the secretary of HHS. And that case made Supreme Court review inevitable. Um, so it raises a number of issues. First, of course, is the constitutionality of the individual mandate. Most of the arguments centered around the Commerce Clause challenge, but from the very beginning, some scholars argued that the individual mandate was a tax. The IRS administers the penalty. But the Obama administration absolutely denied that it was a tax. The first courts to consider the constitutionality of the individual mandate completely ignored it. But it is important to recognize the Fourth Circuit and Judge Kavanaugh both said it was a tax and the Anti-Injunction Act applied. Now, if the Anti-Injunction Act applies, we wouldn't be here because if the Anti-Injunction Act applies, you can't actually bring an action until the tax is actually levied. The tax won't be levied until 2015. It starts coming due in 2014, doesn't come in until 2015. Now, if the individual mandate were found unconstitutional, the next question is, um, is it inextricably tied to the rest of Obamacare? Do you have to throw out all of Obamacare if the mandate itself isn't good? And then finally, somewhat eclipsed by the arguments about the mandate were the so-called Medicaid uh, coercion issue. Now, the 26 attorneys general who challenged the, uh, mounted the challenge, argued that Obamacare uh, expansion of Medicaid was an unconstitutional violation of the spending power. Now, their argument's somewhat curious, and it's worth looking at. What their argument is, is that the federal uh, donation, essentially, to the states through Medicaid is so generous that the states can't say no. And so they are being coerced into expanding uh, into this other part of Medicaid because they would lose all of Medicaid. Now, most of us were surprised, even though Paul Clement wrote the brief, that the court granted cert on this. Um, Medicaid is a voluntary program. And frankly, the spending clause hadn't uh, suffered a real challenge in decades. So the stage was set. There were a record 130 amicus briefs filed. The court heard an almost unprecedented six hours of argument over three days in March. Hundreds demonstrated in front of the court. Uh, gallons of ink and untold pixels were spilled in uh, media commentary. Solicitor General Don Verley was excoriated what was viewed as a pure, uh, poor performance. Uh, he had an incoherent Commerce Clause argument, and he spent far too much time on the taxing power. Uh, Paul Clement, for any of you interested in moot court, I would suggest you listen to Paul Clement. Aided by a receptive court, he was nothing short of magnificent, and it's worth seeing. So in the months following the argument, the Obama administration reportedly prepared for a decision that would find that the mandate was unconstitutional. The court, meanwhile, was on lockdown. I've been told that even the law clerk's Thursday happy hours were closed to outsiders. Um, so if indeed there was this great uh, discussion going on between Roberts and the other conservative justices, nothing leaked before the actual decision. Uh, after, unprecedented. Um, the only hint we actually had was Justice Scalia's uh, dissent in Arizona a couple weeks before. It was for even Scalia unusually angry. 
And so people said, well, he's lost both. So on the morning of June 28th, I, together with an amazing one million other people, was sitting in front of my computer on SCOTUS blog. I had no idea that a million people would ever be that interested in the first decision. My morning bet was a 5-4 decision upholding the mandate under the Commerce Clause. I thought that, predictably, Justice Kennedy would be the fifth vote. Sometimes I thought maybe it'll go to 6-3. Maybe Justice Kennedy will pull the Chief Justice along with him. After all, Justice Kennedy had said health care might be different. I was wrong. We were all wrong. And CNN and Fox News were very publicly wrong for about 30 seconds. So all nine justices agreed that the Anti-Injunction Act did not apply. But that was the end of any semblance of agreement. Five justices voted, but not as a block, to strike down the mandate under the Commerce Clause. The constitutionality of the mandate, however, was saved when five justices, with Chief Justice Roberts writing the opinion, voted to uphold it as a tax under the Taxing Clause. Thank you for really. Seven justices ruled that the financial terms of the Medicaid expansion were too coercive. So much for me. In fact, the Chief Justice said it was a gun to the head of the states. But five justices also voted that the financial terms were severable and thereby saved the Medicaid expansion for the future. Only Chief Justice was, uh, uh, Roberts was in the majority of all parts, major parts of the opinion. So the first question is, did Chief Justice Roberts engage in what Thomas Jefferson, you knew I'd get it in, right? Uh, what Thomas Jefferson called twistifications when he was angry with Justice Marshall in uh, Marbury. Certainly it is curious to hold that the mandate is a tax, but the Anti-Injunction Act doesn't apply. That's weird. The key part of Robert's opinion is where he quotes Justice Story, somewhat archaic language. No court ought, unless the terms of an act rendered it unavoidable, to give a construction to it which should involve a violation, however unintentional, of the Constitution. So what that principle allows him to do is make an inconsistent ruling. He can apply a textual determination to the Anti-Injunction Act and find that it's a penalty. But then he can turn around and look at the individual mandate itself and read it in such a way that may not be what its intended reading was or even what its best reading is. As long as it is a possible reading, he can say it's a tax and it's therefore constitutional. Now, I also don't think that this case is actually, overall, a liberal victory. It's a victory for the Obama administration. It is a big victory for Obamacare. Um, it would be foolish to ignore, though, that overall, the court's decision in Sibelius is actually a move to greatly restrict Congress's powers, spending powers, Commerce Clause powers. Um, since Chief Justice Roberts didn't join the dissent, the full precedential level of the Commerce Clause decision is not that clear. Um, but five justices said that the Commerce Clause is not what we thought it was since Wickard v. Filburn in 1942. Um, more surprising and possibly f more far-reaching is the Spending Clause power decision. Uh, the idea that we're going to greatly limit the spending clause, if you look at cases like uh, Dole v. South Dakota, if you, from the very beginning with Butler in 1936, the spending clause power has always been quite broad. And so this is a major retreat. But what does the ruling mean for the future of health care? The political ramifications probably can't be underestimated. 
Um, most people in the United States don't actually respond to Supreme Court decisions the way most of you in this room do. For most people, a decision against Obamacare would have been a signal that the president did something wrong. That's how they would have interpreted it. What this has allowed in the latter innings of the presidential election has allowed President Obama to fully embrace Obamacare. And that is likely to make a difference, even though it's still polling murkily because no one really understands it. Um, the reality is health care depends on the election. If Romney wins the election, certainly the mandate goes, probably Medicaid goes, some of the other pieces may be retained. Who knows what will happen with Medicare because Medicare is a hot potato. If Obama wins the election, everything's supposed to go into force in 2014. I have no doubt that there will be um, additional lawsuits as we progress through with it. Especially uh, with the exchange program, only 15 states have participated. My guess is that there are going to be a number of states that will resist when they come under complete federal power, which is what Obamacare requires to happen if they haven't taken action. Interestingly, Sebelius has had an effect on industry, and it's, in some ways you can look at this as a business case. Um, remember, it's the insurance companies and the hospitals that actually need Obamacare. The hospitals because of the Medicaid expansion. Medicaid's going to pay for all the charity care they're now taking. The insurance companies actually need the individual mandate to make sure that if they do expand, they're going to be able to pay for it. And interestingly, it's not 2014 yet. And yet, costs are coming down, and more people are being insured. So Sibelius has had this, maybe temporary, but still real, effect making industry confident enough to go forward. Thanks.